hundred who have RSVP'd. And guess what? We are going to reward all of you who are on time by starting right now because it is time to go. Um, I'm Billy Wimstead. I'm the executive director of Movement Voter Project and Movement Voter PAC. And I'm so happy to welcome you here today to defy the odds in 2022, which means win the midterms, supercharge the movement. Say it with me. Defy the odds. We're going to defy the odds. So we're going to get right into this. And basically what you're going to hear today is you're going to hear directly from organizers in Kansas, Michigan, and Arizona, all of whom had primaries last night, which we totally planned. And then we're going to talk more in depth than we ever have before about what all of us can do because that's the number one pe thing people say is what can I do and we are going to talk about that in more depth than we ever have we are 97 days out from the election 47 days out from the start of early vote in Pennsylvania which is when the first early voting starts and so if you want to move money in this election cycle to make a difference in the 2022 cycle, now is the time to do it. Think about everything you want to do and make a plan while you're on this call, while you're listening to us. Your job is to make a plan to move as much money and organize as many people as you can, because this is an all hands on deck moment for our country, for our democracy, and for our world. And history will judge us by what we did or didn't do in these next couple months, which are gonna determine the fate of our country and maybe all of human civilization and everyone who comes after us. So no pressure, it's time to go. And the good news is, the good news is that the momentum is on our side. Say that with me, the momentum is on our side. And I know that's a new story, the old story, Democrat, everything sucks. We're all depressed. We all have COVID and the Democrats are going to lose the midterms, right? That's the old story. That's the old story. Old story. Let me see you brush your shoulders off. That's the old story. Old story. The new story. The new story is this is a jump ball. This is a jump ball and we are going to fight to the finish and no one, no one knows how this is going to end. People thought they knew how Kansas was going to end last night, right? Am I right? People were like, well, obviously, we're going to lose Kansas, right? This is a jump ball. And after an awful year, and we have a lot to brush our shoulders off, it was a truly awful year after an awful year before that. A lot of things are now moving in a better direction. We got to get used to that. This is the new situation. People are mad as hell about POBs. People are mad as hell, scared as hell, motivated as hell. And Democrats have been finally passing some legislation. Hopefully they're going to pass some more good legislation soon. Hopefully cancel student debt. Our partners have been working hard on both of those things. And the generic ballot is now tied. We're not behind. We're tied. And 538, if you looked, I uh, just looked earlier today, 57% chance of Democrats holding the Senate. We're actually up a little bit, right? So we are fighting to the finish. And last night's results from Kansas are a huge ray of hope. The bad news is the funding landscape has been far from what it needs to be because everyone's been depressed. And so whatever you did in 2020, we need you to do it again in 2022, okay? There's a ton of absolutely winnable elections that we're not gonna win if the groups don't get the money. It's a huge, this isn't just me talking, like groups are just like, where is the money this time? So putting this up front, how to get involved, invest as big as you can and organize everyone you can make a plan on this call. Our theory of change is this, we believe in grassroots organizations are the key to winning the elections. And one of the best things we can do is organize our own communities to support the grassroots organizers on the ground. And you're gonna hear later about all the things you can do 
from hosting house parties to all sorts of other things. So um, I'm gonna, without further ado, pass it to my awesome colleague, um, Regina Clemente, who runs the RAPS program in the Western states, all the way, 10 states, all the way from Alaska, where they just flipped um, a utility board, a, a public utility board, and shut down the biggest coal plant in Alaska to Oklahoma and including Kansas. And Regina runs the Western Rural and Plain States program, RAPS program, and is awesome and is going to introduce our special guest, Peyton from Kansas. Go ahead, Regina. Thanks so much, Billy. Super appreciate it. And I am so thrilled to be here with you all tonight after the phenomenal victory in Kansas last night. Um, as Billy said, I'm Regina Clemente, director of the MVP Western Rural and Plain States Project, which we launched out of MVP just at the beginning of last year to really replicate the MVP model in states that are predominantly red and predominantly rural. And like Billy said, we're really kind of in a triangle between Alaska, North Dakota, and Oklahoma and everything red in between. And um, as you can imagine, it hasn't been easy working in any of these places recently and for a very long time. Um, you know, as I talked to groups in Kansas over the last year and a half, it's been really clear how badly they needed a win, like so many of us have. Every day, organizers there face considerable barriers from a new law that their state legislature passed that makes it a felony to register a voter if someone accuses you of posing as an elections official, which is a lot of pressure, obviously to you know, most of the progressive community not thinking their state and groups are a priority, priority to invest in. And um, that's simply not an easy environment to be organizing in. And you know, I will be the first to admit that I didn't think we were gonna win this ballot measure last night. I worked up for Planned Parenthood for many years running ballot measures. Um, and I was like, Kansas 2022 in a primary where there's not competitive democratic races, like, I, I don't think so, but as we now know, um, there was every, every reason to invest. And we invested anyways, because as you know, MVP is not just about winning at the ballot, we're about building power. And so we've been investing in Kansas groups to build power leading up to the vote yesterday, to the vote in November, and for everything in between, um, electoral and non-electoral. Um, and the fact that the groups on the ground managed to not just win at the ballot, which is game changing, right? It's game changing for bodily autonomy, for everyone with uteruses, for the plain states where Kansas is the main access to abortion. But in addition to that, the turnout was just historic. They turned out, they're estimating about 940 thousand Kansans, um, which is over double the regular turnout in a primary. There's only about 3 million folks in Kansas. And so this is just a, a hugely historic turnout on so many different levels. And um, it didn't just happen in the urban parts of the state. It ha happened in all parts of the state from Johnson County, which is urban and it covers uh, the Southwest area of Kansas City, which voted 70% for the no on two side, our side to super rural, tiny Hamilton County, which is in the far west of the state. They voted 81% for Trump in 2020, but only had 55% of voters vote for the yes side, the anti-abortion side of the amendment, which just shows that this was from side to side of, of the wonderful state of Kansas that this was happening. And so tonight we are celebrating the amazing work of our six partners in Kansas and are really, really stoked to have uh, one of them here tonight to tell you stories from the ground. Um, and yes, this also was an effort of people remote phone banking and calling from all throughout the country. So folks were on board to make sure we won in Kansas. Um, I don't think anyone has quite the experience of, of folks actually there. And so I'm thrilled to introduce Peyton Browning, co-founder um, and ED of Prairie Roots, Kansas. Um, and so Peyton, thank you so much for being with here tonight. Please send a huge thank you back to your whole team and um, would love if you could just start off by telling us why did you decide to create Prairie Roots, this fairly new organization in Kansas, um, an organization that focuses on deep canvassing non-voting registered voters? And then after that, if you can just talk a little bit about how did you decide to talk about abortion, I think, before anyone else was going door to door talking about in that state? 
Yeah, well, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I So we created Prairie Roots right after uh, Barbara Bollier's U.S. Senate race. So Barbara and I co-founded Prairie Roots together. Um, and during her 2020 U.S. Senate race, we really saw the need that uh, Kansas needs help building infrastructure mainly, and then also year-round organizing. Um, and then as we were talking to people across the state that year, um, realizing that so many people want to see results in Kansas, but aren't voting or are, you know, maybe voting uh, differently than their values and things like that. So we really wanted to focus on deep canvassing and really getting to the root of, uh, you know, their why for the way that they're voting or, you know, whether they are voting or not. And um, kind of focus really on deep diving into uh, longer conversations with them to um, walk them through a political process. Uh, and then for what made us start talking about abortion uh, at the doors first. So we were the first group in Kansas to start conversations about the uh, abortion ban amendment. Um, and we started back in fall 2021. Um, and we just know that, you know, with year round organizing, it, there was kind of no better time to start than now. And um, and we also know that with especially with non voters, it's, uh, you know, it takes a lot more time and energy and money to turn out those non voters to uh, turn them into frequent voters. And so we knew that we wanted to have multiple touches and conversations with them before uh, actually like running a GOTV program. So we uh, started really, really early and um, it's been really exciting. And uh, we had, uh, you know, a lot of people in our universe, which our universe is uh, Democrats and unaffiliated who are registered to vote, but have not voted in the past 10 years. Um, and so that equals out to, <clears throat> so pre Roe being overturned, our universe was 250,000 people in the state of Kansas. Uh, with all the new registers that happened uh, when Roe was overturned, now that our universe is about 430,000. Um, so that's a lot of people that we could be turning out for the next elections. Wow, that is huge. And can you tell us a little bit, just give us a little window into what, what that was like having those conversations? What are the, some of the things you learned from those conversations? What were folks saying? Yeah, it was uh, very shocking, even from the beginning. Um, really, as soon as we started talking about the amendment, um, you know, these non-voters, they aren't in anyone else's universe um, for campaigns and organizations and uh, whatnot. And so we were really their first political conversation about an upcoming election. And, um, you know, they were kind of shocked by that. Like they're not getting any phone calls, text messages, door knocks, anything else, mailers. Um, you know, they're getting most of their politics and news from either Facebook or TV ads, um, which can be skewed a lot of the times too. Um, so it was really just shocking to see the results immediately. Um, pretty much as soon as we started uh, our program on the abortion amendment, um, <clears throat> consistently about 95, 97% of our uh, voters that we've talked to or non-voters that we had talked to uh, had committed for, to vote for the first time uh, and vote no on this amendment. So it was really from, from the get-go, you know, people were uh, shocked by even finding out that this was coming up on the ballot. You know, it was very low educated, uh, low education kind of, nobody knew this was coming up. Um, especially kind of just the voters in Kansas. And so uh, having those first conversations was really exciting and hearing people, you know, really be totally uh, surprised and shocked and devastated that, you know, the Kansas legislature would put this on the ballot as well. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And, and thank you for, for being out talking to those non-voters and turning them into voters. I know we'll learn a lot more about who actually voted and in a few weeks to a month or so once that data comes back. Um, but I think just a reminder to everyone that this is one of the main reasons MVP started, right? We, we sometimes feel in our world that everyone is super saturated with information, but the reality is infrequent or non-voters are getting next to no contact. And folks like Peyton and her team and their volunteers, maybe the first person that's come to them ever in years. And so just that alone, focusing on these non and low propensity voters has, can have such a huge impact. Um, Peyton, can you tell us just a little bit about what's next? How do you build off of this win? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so we ha Kansas had a 1,038% uh, increase in voter registration since Roe was overturned, and I ran the cross tabs and data on that, and it's mostly kind of people under 40 registering as unaffiliated. Um, and I think that it's really interesting to kind of think about that 
group of new voters um, in terms of like Trump ran twice and it didn't turn them out to vote against him or for him. Um, but Roe being overturned was their moment to start getting involved and having their voice be heard. And so uh, right, you know, starting today and tomorrow is uh, turning around and trying to turn them into frequent voters and having those conversations and making the connection for them about you know, local races, state legislative races, and so on and so forth, um, and why they should be a frequent voter. And uh, for us, we <clears throat> are focusing on flipping the state legislature. Uh, with our research that we've done, uh, like I said, our universe now is 430,000, uh, you know, people that are registered as Democrats or not affiliated, but hadn't voted until uh, last night. And um, so we are, you know, that's more than enough people, like we've done the research for the votes are there in each in each and every county, each and every district, um, and so on and so forth to flip the legislature. And we could do that by 2026. Um, currently, Kansas has uh, super super majority conservative super majorities in both the state house and state senate. And so, um, you know, while we won last night, uh, we know what kind of bills will be put forth into the next legislative session and even the legislative session after that as well. Um, so we need to really flip the state legislature as well to <clears throat> prevent this from happening in the future as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. As y'all can tell, like, there is so much research. There is so much strategy behind what Peyton and Prairie Roots are doing, which is true with so many of our groups. They know what needs to be done. They're doing the tremendously hard work of recruiting more and more folks to be trained up on this work and get out there and do it. And so we just need to be resourcing them as much as possible. And so huge thanks to Peyton. Um, and you guys will get follow-up information on how that you can contribute to Prairie Roots. Um, you can always contact me. I'm Regina at movement.vote. And I'm um, just so honored to get to work with organizers like this in Red State that get so much less attention than others, but who are doing some of the most phenomenal work in the hardest conditions. And um, yeah, just a million thanks to all of them. And I hope that everyone gets some time to breathe and celebrate in Kansas. And I am now uh, going to be passing it over to my fabulous colleague, Cindy Matthews, who's going to talk about uh, more about overviews of what's going on and then some Michigan and Arizona information. So thank you all. Thanks, Regina and Peyton. Um, so great to start off our call with good news. It really outlines the possibilities ahead of us, especially given the authoritarianism we're facing right now. So we have a large number of people who believe the 2020 election was stolen and a Republican Party that's fueling that belief. More than 100 candidates running for office uh, run, are people who believe that the 2020 election was stolen and we have a Republican Party that's fueling that belief. Um, just yesterday in Michigan and Arizona, the two states we're going to talk about today, they elected big lie candidates in Republican primaries. So what happens this November could have a huge impact on what happens in November 2024 and whether or not election results are overturned. So one of the biggest defenses we have against this growing threat is the long-term organizing happening in states right now. The work that you all have helped us fund and grow over the last six years. So we know long-term organizing works. The movements that elected Senators Warnock and Ossoff in Georgia, that elected two Democratic senators in Arizona for the first time in over 60 years, these did not happen in the span of one to two years or only in election years. They were the result of year-round organizing in communities on the issues that matter to them. So that's what we're here to talk about today, the issues that matter to people, why the midterms matter to those, and what MVP's partner groups are doing to hold and advance the line. So in light of recent Supreme Court decisions, our partners' state-based and local work becomes even more critical to hold the line and expand victories on reproductive rights, climate justice, LGBTQ plus rights, any issue you name, it's critical that we defend and expand state and local power while also fighting to keep control of the House and the Senate at the federal level. It really is a both and moment. And as a reminder, um, yep, this is the map of how MVP prioritizes its work. We work on all levels of power and have developed a tiered model of state prioritization, taking into account what's at stake across federal, state, and local races, overlaid against where we also need to win in 2024. So we'll delve deeper into our plans to maintain the Senate and the House on a future call, but we really wanted to dive a, uh, do a bit of a deep dive right now on the states with you. So as you know, MVP works at the state and local levels. It's where we believe power building and organizing are the most effective. In fact, the current imbalance of power in the Senate and the right-wing SCOTUS are a direct result of Republicans having organized and won in states for decades. 
So let's look at abortion access to start. Um, we could get that map up. Um, our friends at Planned Parenthood Action Fund have put together this terrifying map that outlines the electoral states in each state. A full 26 states could ban abortion in light of recent decisions, and another eight are starting special sessions to ban it. And there are ballot initiatives underway in a number of states. Kansas started us off on a good path. We have to continue that momentum. MVP is focused on several important federal races, as well as non-federal races in Michigan, Wisconsin, Georgia, Montana, and Arizona. So the fight here is twofold. We have to hold the Senate and the House, or at least one, to prevent Republicans from passing a national abortion ban. But in the face of federal inaction in terms of proactive abortion policy, we also have to support our groups working on this and other issues at the state level. So MVP works in most of those states, but we wanted to deep dive on a couple of them to give you an idea of the kind of work happening across all of them and why the state elections matter. So here's Jamila Martin, I'm so excited to introduce, who is MVP state advisor for Michigan. She's an organizer in Michigan for 10 years. She started out as a campus organizer. She was with the SEIU and then helped to found an education organizing network in Detroit called 482 Forward. She was co-director until she left to join MVP. Um, she's co-led successful campaigns to repeal punitive school closure legislation and to restore hundreds of millions of dollars in funding to the local school district. I'm so excited to introduce her. Hi, Jamila. Um, Jamila, can you talk to us about what's happening in Michigan right now and what's the context for what's at stake in November? Yeah, absolutely. Um, good evening, everyone. So here in Michigan, you know, it would be hard for there to be more on the ballot and more at stake in November, as folks uh, may know. Um, our governor, secretary of state, attorney general, two state Supreme Court seats, our, of course, entire um, congressional delegation, our entire state legislature, and three really critical ballot measures, um, including one for um, to protect voting rights and to protect uh, reproductive rights in Michigan are all going to be on the ballot in November. And I know that folks, you know, often think of Michigan as a swing state. Of course, that's why we're a tier one state here, um, at MVP. We go back and forth. Last in 2020, we had a really exciting outcome of, of flipping um, from red to blue. But at the state level, Michigan really has a very deep Republican history. So over the past 30 years, Republicans have had trifectas at the state level, 14 of those 30 years. Democrats have never had a trifecta and in fact have never um, even controlled more than one chamber, one, one legislative chamber. So this really is a challenge for us. And, and as Cindy said, last night Republicans elected um, across the board election deniers. So everything is at stake um, this year. And Jamila, what's the role of the MVP groups that you work with? What are they working on right now in Michigan? Yeah, so right now, so our primary was yesterday. <laughs> So right now, um, folks are probably exhausted, um, but they're starting to debrief what happened yesterday. They're moving on from whatever their primary targets were. So a lot of our grantees do engage in primaries. It's important that the folks we elect, um, even from our safer seats, of course, represent our values. And so they do engage in primaries, both the state and federal level. Um, they're moving on to now the kind of more purple areas in the state. They're starting to ramp up. And in particular, I mean, I think this is something that's really similar with what we heard, what we just heard from Canvas. Our grantees are honing the conversation that they're having with less likely voters, with our friends and family in our communities who are often disillusioned by the election process. You know, as maybe some of you on this call, you know, felt like you gave everything you had in 2020. Maybe you even voted for somebody you weren't that excited about voting for, but you felt like, you know, you were um, minimizing harm, you were doing what was right, you were maybe even sometimes holding your nose um, or, or giving more money than you wanted to. And then not everything that you thought was gonna happen maybe happened. Now, obviously there's been new federal news and, and there's an excitement there, um, but I will say at the state level, you know, um, even though we did, um, uh, you know, even though uh, we voted Democrat at the federal level here in Michigan, um, we still had a Republican controlled Senate and House at the state level. And so it was very difficult for our governor on top of pandemic to move, um, to move her agenda and the people's agenda forward. And folks felt that, you know, in the neighborhoods, folks felt the disillusionment um, there. And so our groups, our partners 
are having these very nuanced, serious conversations with people about why to show up um, in November and, and what their path to power is um, through the elections. Relating to that and also going back to Kansas as well, talking about motivation, um, with in relation to the Dobbs decision, recent polling has found that it is an incredibly motivating issue across mobilization, mobilization and persuasion targets. Can you tell us a little bit about what's at stake in Michigan on this issue, what the groups are doing, um, and how they're using it to mobilize constituencies? Yeah, and this is really critical. Um, so Michigan is um, a state that allows ballot initiatives and citizen initiated ballot initiatives. So uh, a, a number of leaders here in Michigan had the foresight to get together a constitutional amendment ballot initiative that would protect reproductive rights here in Michigan. Uh, Michigan is a trigger state, so we have a 1931 law banning abortion. Our um, Democratic mm -hmm. governor and Democratic attorney general have taken a number of steps to prevent this law from being implemented right now. It really speaks to the, the importance of fighting at every level, fighting on every election. Um, so both the, the governor and the attorney general have gone to court, um, or, or sorry, the governor has, has taken this to court as has Planned Parenthood. They have, the state Supreme Court, um, we flipped that to a democratic majority by one seat in 2020. And so again, that's a really critical kind of piece of our infrastructure to protect um, the right to choose here in Michigan. Um, our attorney general has said that she will not enforce the ban and many of our local county prosecutors, some of whom our partners worked to elect, have also said that they will not enforce the ban. Some of our more conservative county prosecutors, however, have said that they will, um, that they will enforce the ban. And so this constitutional amendment um, is incredibly important. So organizers collected the most signatures in the history of signature collection here in Michigan. They submitted those just a couple of weeks ago and they're in process now to be confirmed um, by the Board of Canvassers. And we anticipate that it will be on the ballot in November. This is gonna be a really, really important fight, very similar to what just happened in Kansas. Um, so it's gonna be a really important fight, not just for um, you know, protecting reproductive freedom in Michigan, but also for organizers on the ground mm -hmm. to help close the distance between the ballot and people's lived experiences. Um, on to another uh, recent SCOTUS decision that also has impacts on Michigan. Uh, recently, there was a ruling on EPA, the EPA's ability to regulate carbon emissions that also impacts the Clean Air and Water Act. And to your point, that will also make state attorney general seats even more critical. Um, can you talk about what's at stake in November for climate related issues in Michigan? Yeah, I mean, Michigan, of course, when we talk about climate change, there's the work of decarbonizing. There's also the work um, of preparing and mitigating the impact of climate change that, that we know is coming. And Michigan has a unique um, role there as a Great Lakes state um, in protecting such a, a critical body of fresh water. Um, and so <laughs> folks on this call um, who know me know that I'm very passionate about uh, protecting our mm. fresh water. Michigan currently, unfortunately, allows private companies to pump that water essentially for free and to sell it off for profit. Um, and so there are actually a number of groups here in Michigan who are focused really at that nexus of water and climate change. One really, really exciting thing that happened in this fight last night is that Jen Hill, who is a climate champion and a clean water champion, was elected in a really competitive Democratic primary where her uh, opponent had been endorsed by and kind of given the blessing, well, endorsed by and given the blessing of, um, of a Democrat who's not such a champion, you know? And so this is, I mean, that is the level of kind of savviness that our groups, our partners have to have so that, you know, when we get majorities, which we will, we have the right folks in place to actually move the needle for our community. So I'm super excited about what that primary means for us. And hopefully, you know, once we get past November, the kind of climate champions who we will have in the legislature. 
Um, and we have just a couple of minutes, but I would love for you to share a recent story, inspiring story from one of the Michigan grantee partners. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go back to the ballot initiative. This is kind of the theme of this call. It's maybe not supposed to be, <laughs> but um, in 2018, so in 2018, Michiganders got to vote on some really, really important ballot initiatives. We voted for um, nonpartisan redistricting, which has been critical over the past year. Every single MVP grantee um, or partner participated in the nonpartisan redistricting process. And because of that, we ended up getting much better maps than we've had historically. Still um, problematic, but much better. Um, we also passed a massive voting rights expansion that was critical during the pandemic. It allowed folks to vote absentee for no reason from home. It allowed us to have drop boxes, to have early voting and for all kinds of voting rights that we did not have before in Michigan. And that we didn't know, of course, would be so important in a pandemic. Um, but there were two ballot initiatives that we thought we were going to be able to vote on that we were not. And that was to increase the minimum wage um, and to require employers of a certain size to offer um, paid sick time to all of their employees. And the reason that we were not allowed to vote on those ballot measures is that even though organizers collected the requisite number of signatures, the Republican led legislature used a loophole to adopt directly both of those measures, wait until after the election and then gut them during lame duck. And what that did not, is not only you know, destroy those very important agenda items, but it really took off the table for any progressive measure, the ability to move forward through a ballot initiative. Essentially anybody, anybody who wanted to do anything by ballot initiative in Michigan now has to be making constitutional changes because you know, that's not kind of um, susceptible to this particular loophole. And that's just not how, you know, you don't want everything to be in the constitution. So anyhow, since 2018, Mothering Justice and Restaurant Opportunity Center of Michigan, who are both um, MVP partners, have been fighting this, um, this really atrocious kind of undermining of democracy. And they've been in court, they've been working with the attorney general, they've been pressing any way that they can. And two weeks ago, they got their first um, positive decision by a court. And so it's been appealed, of course, we know that, um, but it is going to a Democratic majority state Supreme Court. Um, and so we are really excited about that result. And it just really speaks to the importance of our, of our partners year round organizing um, and fighting at every level. Thank you so much, Jamila. And when you said earlier, like, you don't know if this, this is what we're supposed to be talking about. This is what we're supposed to be talking about, right? The issues that are actually impacting their lives. So thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, and for folks on the call, please make sure you're signed up for our newsletters and everything, and we will make sure that you continue to get updates on all this kind of work. Um, and now to switch our focus to another state, Arizona, where there was also a primary yesterday and where there's important state work, uh, but also a Senate seat that we need to hold. I'm so excited to introduce Monse Arredondo from Arizona Wins, which is a coalition organization consisting of labor, civic engagement, community organizing, reproductive rights, environmental, and other progressive organizations. Um, over the last 10 years, Arizona Wins has been instrumental in shifting Arizona to become a more progressive state. Um, so before we get into what's happening in Arizona right now, I actually want folks to hear Monse's story in her own words, because in some ways it is really representative of a generation of organizers in Arizona and follows the track of change that's been happening there for a decade. Um, so Monse, hi, and thank you for joining us. Can you share that story with us? Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me. I um, just wanna give a shout out really quick to MVP for all of their support. I'm so glad that I was on this call to hear about Kansas um, firsthand, you know, and not just read about it. And um, wow, Jamila, the, the, your Michigan points, just hit every beat of what's been happening in Arizona. And that goes um, back to my start. You know, I started in this work in 2009, 2010, came to this work because my mom was undocumented. She's still undocumented to this day. And thinking of going to college and finding out that many of my close friends were also undocumented, many of which were finding out for the very first time. And we went into the immigrant, immigrant rights work and join a lot of folks that had been fighting Arpaio and Sheriff Arpaio in the state for a long time, and then got hit with this nasty show me your papers bill, which was SB 1070, that not only targeted um, 
undocumented people, but all people of color, anybody that looked like they could potentially not be US citizens. And we all know that means that people that didn't don't look white. Um, and since then, um, in, in the work, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of a, a team here, a community here that um, has been really scrappy together until we got to a place where we in 2016 passed the minimum wage ballot measure with sick time and then in 2020 um, um, showed out by winning the presidential election and the U U.S. Senate election. Um, and that those wins did not come or haven't come easy and are still huge wins that are every day a battle to protect and to keep our battleground status and to keep our our purple status and uh, we can't let up we can't let up so that actually leads me to my next question can you tell us about what's happening in arizona right now give us the latest political state of play and the context of what's at stake for november yeah, yeah, we just had our primary elections just yesterday. Some of those results are still coming in, but I can tell you right now that pretty much every Trump endorsed candidate um, has made it through and are going to be who we are up against. And um, that says a lot. I know everybody on this call knows that, that, that what we're not just talking about Repu a Republican or Republicans, we're talking about a certain kind of Republican and that is the Trump Republican, the MAGA Republican. And in Arizona, we know that that is the sheriff or pile type of Republican that is eager to see um, people that look like me, um, folks like my mom out of the state and um, to be known again as that deep red Arizona. And, um, on our on our democratic side, you know, we we saw some great um, turnout for the governor's race. Like like Michigan, all of our statewide races are are up right now, um, and all of that is on the ballot. And we have the busiest ballot we've ever seen, will ever see, or we have seen to date, with um, um, up to eight potential ballot measures, both referred by the legislature and also um, citizen led ballot measures. So can we dig into the democracy ballot initiative a little? So first of all, huge congratulations to your coalition for gathering almost 500,000 signatures. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, yeah. Uh, please share with folks the impacts it would have, the opposition you're facing, including the lawsuit that's been filed by a right-wing organization and what you think it's gonna take to win. Yeah, I mean, this ballot measure is all about protecting democracy and ensuring people's ability to vote. And three of the four um, sorry, three of the four um, legislator, um, legislative referred ballot measures are anti-democracy and directly conflict with the fair elections ballot measure. So it is even more crucial that this is not only on the ballot, but that it wins. And we're competing one yes to three no's. And that's the, the kind of conflicting messaging that is going to take a lot of education and a lot of um, effort to break through the noise and you know ballots drop for early voting um, 70 less than 80 days from now you know so folks are going to start voting and seeing those things and it's going to look like a really long busy ballot that's one and um you know i just can't say enough um the support that we have gotten from partners like MVP for this ballot measure. I want to say that we started the year really pushing for this, making a case for this as early as last year and saying that this is the most important thing. And we got a lot of pushback um, from funders, um, from traditional strategists that were saying, nah, this is not the path. Stop talking about that. Stop trying to raise money about on that. And now we're being told like, hey, make sure you talk about the ballot measure, like good thing you got it on the ballot. And it was a hard effort and it was something that partners on the ground really stuck with and um, came together with. And actually the MVP state advisor here helped to support that kind of coordination. Um, and, and we broke through and, and it wasn't just a movement effort. I was just talking to folks about how the party really mobilized and got almost 100,000 of those close to 500,000 signatures through their precinct committee um, um, web, you know, their volunteers. Um, and 
it just goes goes to show like the the party and their and just everyone in Arizona's knowledge and and our local um smarts of the the our voting our voting being in a, under attack and how that affects every other issue that we're facing um like this abortion issue that is also a big deal here in Arizona there's this theme that started at the beginning of the call too and that folks didn't think this could happen but the groups knew that yes. they could do it and they just needed to get the funding to do it right like shout out to Billy for that yeah yes, yes. like <laughs> the groups know what they need they know what they can do and they know what they can win um so the groundwork for so much of Arizona's organizing has been focused on Latinx populations in Maricopa County, as you talked about with the SB 1070 work. Um, but I know you all have been working hard on expanding the ecosystem of other voters, rural, Native American, Black, youth, AAPI, and other emerging constituencies. Uh, can you tell us about the geographic issue and constituency expansion work happening in these areas? And if you could tell us a story or two about groups in these constituencies to paint a picture of what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in our tenure at the at the coalition, we've really um, been able to help partners not only grow by regional reach, but also grow our um, constituency groups. And that happened here at the table through to an API led organization and um, a native vote led organization that we've been incubating. Um, and propelling forward to become independent organizations um, and our partners at the table. One and two, um, supporting um, our, our partner groups to not just be engaged or get resources during the election cycles, but also be invested in so that they continue to do that leadership pipeline work and continue to get um, investment for their other the other pieces of, of organizing that has to happen, you know, to ensure that folks are, are engaged. And I saw something earlier on the chat about, you know, are, are we sure that if abortion isn't on the ballot, people are going to come out and being able to be on the ground year in, year out allows us to have a better um, idea or a better um, scope if that's going to happen. And ideally that, that, that kind of work and that kind of investment happens for Kansas and it doesn't stop for Arizona. Thank you so much, Monse. The work you all are doing is so critical. Um, and for folks on this call, we'll send out a follow-up that includes ways to support Monse and Arizona Wind's work directly. They are currently facing a $13 million C4 gap, uh, and they have an immediate need of two and a half million for August and September. So we'll send out information and please feel free to reach out to any of us for more information. Thank you again, Monse. Um, and now I am so excited to introduce my colleague, Zoe Toby. Zoe is the Director of Donor Organizing at MVP, and he will be talking with you about ways you can get involved if you would like to do more than donate. Uh, thanks, Zoe. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe. I'm honored to lead our donor organizing program. And uh, just waiting for the slides to come up. OK, so um, the mission that uh, we are going for with the donor organizing program at MVP is to build a movement of donors organizing their communities to fund the grassroots organizing that wins elections and creates lasting social transformation. That's what we're up to. I know it sounds a bit lofty, but uh, really it's what we all need to do together if we wanna win this election and if we wanna create the long-term uh, power building that's going to lead to the world that we want to see. So uh, I am thrilled to actually introduce one of our superstar uh, volunteer donor organizers, Margaret Birch, who uh, is going to be sharing a bit of her story of how she came to be involved with MVP. And our hope is that it inspires you to get involved too. So uh, Margaret, it's so good to be with you. Uh, let's, let's get you on spotlight here, get you on video. And um, <laughs> I'd love to just, you know, have you talk about when did you know that you wanted to get involved with MVP? All right. Thank you, Zoe. And I'll keep going. I'm not sure if I'm, here we go. Start my video. Good. Ah, uh, there we go. We'll see. All right. There we go. Great to be here. Thanks very much. It is so exciting to hear from folks in all these places because it just reinforces why we're trying to organize more folks to be donors. I, I've been doing election work my whole life. 
I started in middle school just a few years ago, and I feel like I can remember when we were stuffing envelopes in the McCarthy campaign when I was going door to door in high school. And so I've done this all my life, but fast forward, the pandemic happened, the 2020 election happened, and we realized that you know, um, Georgia was gonna have this runoff and this exciting opportunity to elect two democratic senators. And because of the pandemic, we were like, well, we aren't gonna go to Georgia. And folks in Georgia said, don't come to Georgia. There's too many people <laughs> that wanna come to Georgia. So we were able to go to an MVP webinar that happened that Billy hosted. And we got to hear NCO Fudd from the New Georgia Fund. We got to hear Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright from Black Voters Matter. And my husband and I both looked at each other and said, oh my gosh, this is what we need to be doing. We need to be sending money. We don't need to be going and trying to knock on doors because there's people already there who know their communities and who are doing this organizing work. Um, and they're organizing for the long term. And if we just parachute in and knock on a few doors, we're not gonna make anywhere near the impact that they can. So that's when we realized, let's raise some money for MVP. Um, we were so excited and we talked to some friends and said, are you in? And at that time, most of you remember, everybody was working on Georgia. So everybody was like, yes, what can we do? And we were able to put together a great team. We got some help designing a Zoom event and we got some co-hosts and we got some donors to make some big donations. So we did a one hour Zoom event, we got 70 people because so many co-hosts had invited their friends and their networks. And we raised $30,000 in one event. And it was so exciting because we knew that it was going to the folks and then we won Georgia um, and had like two hours to celebrate. <laughs> but that's when I realized that this is what it makes sense to do. And I still like to do some phone banking because I love talking to voters, but I'm much more excited about raising money at this point and especially for MVP. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, I, I know you still do some phone banking, so it's like, it's really not, you know, either or, but um, what, what have, what's been most exciting and, and um, meaningful about uh, engaging in this way as a, as a donor organizer and that kind of engagement, which I know is so different than, you know, calling voters in states you don't live in. Uh, how's that been for you? Well, first of all, it's been fun. And Second of all, I feel like what I'm doing is really about racial justice and social justice. It's so much more than elections. Um, and I feel like, yes, we need to win. We need to win the House and the Senate. But especially when I hear the kinds of reports that we're getting from Kansas tonight, from Michigan, from Arizona, what I realize is we're talking, and Latasha Brown talks about transforming the political landscape. It really is what we're about. We're about putting resource into communities of color and building long-term political power. And to me, that's so much more exciting than trying to do an election cycle. And it just has so much more potential and it makes so much sense. This is the generation of leadership that we need to be supporting. It's this young, diverse leadership that is working in local communities and getting non-voters out who have never voted because we know midterms are gonna be won by voter turnout. That's what's going to make the difference. And you can hear what's happening on the ground. And that's the other thing that I love about MVP. You really can get firsthand what's happening on the ground in so many places. And it's a very exciting thing to be a part of. Um, I know that sometimes uh, we, we get a little nervous about asking for money. Um, the moment that you ask people to donate, what what is it that you focus on that makes it fun for you? Because I know you actually literally have fun doing this uh, <laughs> <laughs> instead of just purely terrifying. Right, right. Well, I have to say it's scary for sure. And one of the things I love about MVP is that there's a lot of support and we've had workshops and trainings about doing fundraising pitches. And there's a volunteer community that supports each other and we can get tips from each other and talk to each other. There's a ton of materials that MVP provides. So just putting in a pitch, I mean, it's it makes it so much easier when you've got this great staff behind you to do this work. So that's one thing. It's still scary for sure. But I think the fun part for me is that people are so relieved when they realize that there's a group they can support that is going to figure out, because there's a great team of researchers, figure out where the money can best be spent. They know, for instance, Arizona needs money right away to meet to fill their gap. 
And so we don't have to worry about all those thousands of emails we're getting that say, this candidate's ahead, that candidate's behind, or we need money for this race, or you know, we're all trying to figure out, so many people are trying to figure out where should they send money. And when I tell them, come and learn about MVP, and I encourage you to put your dollars into Movement Voter Project because this is the place that is going to make the difference in the long run and it's going to make the difference in voter turnout. People are relieved. It's like, oh, great. Now I don't have to worry about all this. <laughs> so that makes it fun. And I feel like a lot of people are hesitant to, to ask for money. And it's like, well, my friends don't have money or I don't want to offend them or impose on them. So I don't feel comfortable asking. And actually people are looking for ways to participate and contribute. And that's been my experience. Not everybody does, and you have to send out lots of invitations. Um, not everybody responds, but so many people do. And then they say, oh, I'm gonna tell my friends about this, or I'd like to co-host so I can invite my friends to hear this. Um, and that's how it just keeps building. And that's been my experience. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I, I just happened to catch in the chat, somebody uh, said something along the lines of, wow, Margaret is just as inspiring as Billy. <laughs> and <laughs> I want everybody listening to pay attention to that comment. Margaret <laughs> is just as inspiring, if not more, because she's not getting paid for this. She's paying us. <laughs> she is literally paying us to, and, and raising money for, for but, you know, MVP. Yeah, somebody comment, I saw a comment about Billy Wimps up being a camp counselor. And I think, I mean, it, there's just, it's fun to be so excited about a project because it's true, you can share it. I don't think I was ever a camp counselor, but that's a very high compliment. I'm, <laughs> but it is fun. It's fun to talk to people because so many people are despairing. So many people are discouraged. They just don't think we can do this. And I really appreciate Billy's, like, that's the old story. The new story is jump ball and we're gonna win this. We can do this. Um, and I think so many of us need to keep, I tell people, please come. I even tell people, if you don't, if you can't donate, come to a, a, host, a house party, come and hear a, a national briefing, come learn about MVP because once people hear about it, then they donate more or they donate and they hadn't planned on donating. Um, I even get donors who donate and I say, but please still come to the party um, because what I really want you to do is hear about it because there's such a need for this information and people just are not aware of all the grassroots organizing that's going on and how powerful it is. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, speaking of donating, we're going to ask everybody now to take out your checkbooks, take out your wallets. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, ideally, we'd love for you to donate online. Um, I'm going to just share a little bit about uh, why it's important to give now and how to get involved if you'd like to do more and then pass it off to Billy to close us off. So uh, please, if Margaret's story or if the rest of what you heard tonight resonates with you, uh, please donate tonight. Use the link in the chat. Tom just shared it. And if you've already given, I want you to share in the chat right now. Just take a moment and type it up. What motivates you to give? Who and what are you doing this for? What's important to you about this? So share in the chat what motivates you to give. And if you haven't yet, or if you want to give more, um, just take a moment and think about what matters to you most personally about this election. Think about the, the stakes that are the most urgent to you, the, the issues that you care about most, the, the people, the, uh, the issues that you, that you most want to uh, make sure that these grassroots groups have the funding to mobilize around and just use the link in the chat to donate. Give all that you can. Give what's authentic, uh, whether that would be, uh, you know, $5 or 5000 or 50000 Please uh, give everything that you can. So um, that's what I want to say about giving. And if you are interested in doing more than giving, um, I just want to emphasize Volunteering to get out the vote is great. We need people to do that. And what we're doing here is also so important. The heart of donor organizing, as I see it, is understanding that these grassroots groups that we've been hearing from tonight in the, in the swing states and the districts that matter most for the, the key elections around the country, they are the best at generating turnout. And they're gonna be here after the election to mobilize, to organize, to advocate, to make sure that we get the policies passed that uh, 
lead us to the world that we want to see. So one of the best things we can do is organize our communities to fund them. So this, for me, this is fundamentally an act of solidarity. And so if this interests you, if donor organizing interests you, I'm going to just share two quick ways that you can uh, get involved after this briefing. We can go to the next slide. The One of the best things you can do is host or co-host a house party fundraiser. Um, I'm not going to say it's just easy piece of cake. It takes some work, but it is so worth it. It's so rewarding. It's so fulfilling. We will support you. We've got toolkit. We've got slide decks, videos. We've got everything you need, volunteer community to support you. And you can sign up to, uh, to learn more with the link that was just shared in the chat. And if you want to start smaller, if you want to take a smaller step right away, you can use our online personal fundraising tool to create a fundraising page, share it with your friends, your family, your network. And uh, I say set a goal to raise $500, just $500 in the next five days. And that's really just 10 people that you know giving $50 each. So follow the link in the chat. Uh, and you'll also get all this by email as well. But uh, please, if if you want to be involved between now and the election, we would just we would love to have you. And as the groups shared tonight, uh, we need all the funds that we can get in the field. Uh, we are nowhere near um, <laughs> doing all that we can before the election. So uh, that's what I have to say about that. And I think with that, we're actually going to uh, put up a poll. To on the screen just to get a sense of how folks would like to be involved. So as you see this poll, just you know answer it, and we'll follow up with you, and you'll you'll get an email as well, and everyone will also get a uh, copy of the recording. So um, as you fill out this poll, I just want you to ask yourself, what can I give and do now, so that I wake up the morning after the election with no regrets? What can I give? and do now to wake up the morning after the election with no regrets. So we're gonna leave the poll up for folks to uh, continue to respond and the responses are coming in now, this is great. Um, and Billy, I'm gonna turn it back to you to close us out. So Margaret, this is so beautiful. I'm just in the chat, I'm just so overcome with, and you know what the, the secret to all of this is, is it's not about the money. It's not about winning elections. It's about building a movement community that that gives us a sense of life and connection to each other. I love the way Margaret talked about, I do it because it's fun. Like, and it's fun because we're doing it with other people. We're doing it with each other. So I just want to ask everyone to just imagine yourself as part of a beloved community all over the country that includes Peyton and Regina, and Monse, and Jamila, and Cindy, and me, and Margaret, and Zoe, and all the people who've written in the chat. We are an incredible community that contains millions of people. And what we're doing is we're acting together. This image of a jump ball, you know, picture two hands going up in a jump ball. And either hand could get the ball, right? And it's just like, do you jump a little higher? Do you have a little more energy? Do you want it a little bit more? Do you have a little bit more skill when you're touching the ball? It's, it's a matter of inches that are going to determine the entire fate of our country, the entire fate of our world. And we're holding hands together to do something really big and transformative together. And what it feels like is little conversations like this, little gatherings with one you know, other person, three other people with your family. And, and together we are gonna build this movement community that as a byproduct of that is gonna move all the resources that are needed to the front lines, to Monse's work, to Peyton's work, to the work that Jamila supports in Michigan and all across the country to transform this country. We have the people, we have the resources, we have the love, we have everything we need. And I can't tell you what a big difference it makes 
when you go from being someone who listens to someone who donates, someone who donates to someone who tells your friends and sends out just a simple email or a Facebook message or co-host an event. And eventually, if enough people become like the Margots of the world and the Rob Beams and the, you know, all the other folks um, I saw in the chat who already have, have made this one of their, their big things that they do, um, and and are part of this movement, like even a couple more of those would make huge difference. So I want to go back to we're we're at time, but I just want to go back to the the um the challenge that I gave everyone at the beginning of the call to make a plan for what you're going to do. And we're here to help. You don't have to do it by yourself. We have an incredible team. As soon as you raise your hand, we're here to, to work with you and support you and help bring you into this beloved movement organizing community that we're, we're building. Um, and that, you know, whatever the results of the election are, is, is, what is going to to sustain us to keep doing this work. Munsey can tell you how that has happened in Arizona. We need to build what Munsey has built in Arizona and all her her movement colleagues. We have to build that together all over the country to transform this country. So we're so just grateful to be in this work with with everyone. Huge thanks to everyone in the movement voter project movement voter pack team who who made tonight happen um so many people working so hard um and we have 97 days 96 after today go team um for for this election that's going to change the course of history and for the the world that we create after that thank you with so much gratitude to everyone and um go team Look at all these notes in the chat. This is so beautiful. <laughs> and we ended the call and there's still almost 200 people on. <laughs> no one wants to leave, but um, but we are actually going to close the call. So huge thanks to everyone. And if you filled out the poll, our team will be in touch with you. And let's build this together. Mwah, mwah, mwah.